Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Bible study today again. We thank you very much because your spirit has always been faithful to us. In this present series of Exodus, it's been an enriching time of study. And we have seen the greatness of our God, the might of our God, the riches in his word. Lord, we thank you because you have favored us so much. That these words were written by inspiration. That holy men of God wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And you have granted us the enlightenment from the Spirit of God. As we have gone from chapter to chapter. And definitely it is affecting our Christian lives. It's affecting our understanding of who God is. It's affecting our understanding of the uselessness of idols and other gods. It's affecting us to make us know the supremacy and the power, the omnipotence of our God. It's also making us to understand that nobody can successfully resist and reject the will and the word of God and go scot-free. Lord, we thank you because you have given us a humble heart a tender heart, a believing heart, wanting to follow after you, wanting to bend the knee and bow before you, that our God is the mighty God in heaven. We also thank you, Lord, because of the wisdom that you have preserved for us in your word. We know that this word as we study and as we believe, as we pray, will make us wise unto salvation and make us wise unto clinging with to our God. Father, we just pray that as we come to study today, this solemn and serious chapter that will speak to our hearts once again in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that every kind of lightness and frivolity will be taken away from our attitude in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord, as we come before you to see you in your greatness, in your majesty, and in your power so that we will receive not just enlightenment alone, but we'll receive grace and strength from the Lord that all through our lives will bow the knee to say that our Lord is God indeed. Be with us, O Lord, as we study today and help us that we may behold wondrous things out of thy word. In Jesus' wonderful and mighty name, we pray. We bless the name of the Lord once again for bringing us to the Bible study today. I'm so grateful to God that he has implanted something within you. That you always desire to want to study the word of God. And I believe that the word of God, the study of the word, is bearing fruit in every one of our lives. I plead with you that you will open your heart to the word of God once again today. As we come to this serious and solemn chapter in the book of Exodus. Today we're looking at Exodus chapter 8. You see the title on your outline. It is a demonstration of God's power in judgment. Well, you need to understand there are various areas and various ways and for various reasons that God may exercise his power. There are times in mercy he exercises his power. In love he exercises his power. In wisdom he exercises his power. But then there comes a time in the life of men and women. There comes a time in the life of a nation. There comes a time in the life of a particular era, generation, that God has to demonstrate his power in judgment. You remember the time of the flood? He demonstrated his power in judgment. You remember the time of Sodom and Gomorrah? He demonstrated his power in judgment. You will remember all through the history of the children of Israel later when they had to be taken into captivity. He demonstrated his power in judgment. You remember Nebuchadnezzar. You remember Belshazzar. You remember Herod. And you remember quite a host of other people where God had to demonstrate his power, but in judgment. We thank God that in our own case, because we are the people of God, God has been demonstrated his, uh, demonstrating his power in love, in mercy. Because the greatest manifestation of his power in our lives is that he saved us. It's just like we learned yesterday in Romans chapter 1. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus, of Christ. Because it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greeks. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. 
as it is written, the just shall live by faith. You see, because we have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, the demonstration of his power has been in mercy, in forgiveness, in the grace of God, and also in salvation and transformation. Here we are today, looking at this serious chapter in Exodus. Exodus chapter 8. We're looking at it from verse 1. But before then, can I give you an overview of all these plagues? You see, sometimes when you study the plagues, the judgments in isolation, it may be all right that you take them one by one and you study because then you are able to see the details in every plague. But sometimes it's good to bring everything together and see the design of God and see the beauty and see the order. I'll be talking about the order next week more than I will talk about it today. But when you see everything arranged, you see the order, you see everything that God is doing, you will just bow in submission and wonder that our God is not only great, is not only mighty, is also wise, is mighty. Look at this. The Egyptians had been oppressed. Sorry, the Egyptians had oppressed Israel for more than 80 years. God had sent his servants to Pharaoh to release his people, but Pharaoh had rebelled against God, and he had increased the hardship of the people. God had promised to deliver the children of Israel with a strong and a mighty hand. Pharaoh rejected God's word and God's authority, so he invited God's judgment upon himself and upon Egypt. As we look at the succession of terrible judgments that descended upon Pharaoh and Egypt, you will see that they were ten in number. Number one, river Nile was turned into blood. Number two, the frogs covered the land of Egypt and entered the homes of all the Egyptians. Number three, lies, little, little insects came upon men and upon animals. Number four, swarms of flies in their multitudes like they had never seen, invaded the homes of the Egyptians and covered the ground. Number five, a grievous disease called moraine, uh, smote the cattle. Number six, boils and sores, blains. All were sent on men and also upon bees. Number seven, thunder and hail and fire destroyed the plants and the trees. Number eight, there were locals, thousands, in fact, millions of them that covered the land of Egypt and consumed all their vegetation. Number nine, there was thick darkness that overspread the land for three days. And then number ten, the firstborn of man and beast died. Now, as I told you, next week I'll be talking about the order. And I'll be talking about some very interesting and very breathtaking things we'll see in this place. But today, let me just uh, tell you, what the psalmist has said concerning these plagues, he said, God cast upon them the fierceness of his anger and his wrath and his indignation and trouble by sending evil angels among them. He made a way to his anger and he spared not their soul from death, but he gave their life over unto the pestilence and he smote all their firstborn in Egypt, the chief of their strength. There is much to learn from the record of these judgments. Think about this. God fought against Egypt in five ways or by five means. Number one, by the elements, water, earth, air, fire. Number two, he fought against them by different animals, frogs, lice, flies, locusts. Number three, he fought against them by men, chosen men, Moses and Aaron. Number four, he fought against them, according to the psalmist in Psalm 78, verse 49, by the angels. And then even, number five, by the sun, by the moon, by the stars, and withdrawing their light. Can you see what God has done? It shows us that everything under the sun is in the hand of God, is under the control of God. Can you think of God fighting against someone by his chosen men? by selected angels, by elements of the world, of the earth, by different animals, and by everything you can think about. There's another dimension we need to look at in the plagues that came upon the land of Egypt. 
there, there were plagues that affected all their five senses. If you know the five senses of man, number one, hearing, number two, seeing, number three, smelling, number four, tasting, number five, touching or feeling. Look at them one by one. In their seeing, because they lost all their sight when the plague of darkness took away their light for three days. It affected their seeing. Number two, in their hearing, as dread and terror seized upon them with deafening sound of those frightful thunders in the plague of the hill. Number three, in their smelling, can you imagine the stench of dead frogs all over the land? When all those frogs died in the land, we're going to read about it today. Number four, in their testing, you, you, you can't imagine how it was when they were denied of good drinking water, of luscious fruit, and their daily fish diet. And number five, in their touching or feeling, when there were so many boils all over them and sores all over their body, which spoiled all their beauty, wherein they greatly prided themselves. What are we saying? What we're saying is this, that when the great day of God's wrath comes, we shall be able to to stand. And in Psalm 76, verse 7, the psalmist says, Thou, even thou, art to be feared, and who may stand in thy sight when once thou art angry. That's why the psalmist also tells us, Kiss the Son, believe the Son, embrace the Son, do homage unto the Son, lest he get angry and ye perish in the way. Then we're told in the New Testament, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And so may we tell Pharaoh, Pharaoh, isn't it a fearful thing? So may we tell all those magicians, isn't it a fearful thing? So may we tell all the servants of Pharaoh and all the land of Egypt, isn't it a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God? It is that fearful thing we're reading about today. The plagues, the judgments, the chastisement that came upon the people of Egypt. And yet, I want you to realize, in fact, I'm going to do something for you here. Look at chapter 8, and I'm going to read verses 22 and 23 before I go back to verse 1. Chapter 8, verses 22 and 23. And I will sever in that day the land of Goshen, in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there. To the end thou mayest know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth, and I will put a division between my people and thy people, and tomorrow shall be this sign. You see, God took care of his own people. As we're reading about these judgments and these plagues and the fiery indignation and the wrath of God that came upon the Egyptians, let us understand that in the case of the children of Israel, the people of covenant, the descendant of Abraham, the people that knew God and the people that God wanted to deliver. In their own case, it was peace. It was protection. It was a manifestation of the love of God. And all these sufferings that came upon Egypt did not come upon them. I'm rejoicing with you that if you are a child of God, all the things that are going to come upon the world in the great tribulation, Incidentally, I'm going to also uh, link up all these plagues we're, going, we're reading about. I'm going to link it up with every event that takes place at the, great, at the time of the Great Tribulation. And that is reserved for next Monday. You see, all these things that we're studying, it has an effect in the past. It has an effect in the present. It has an effect in the far future, eschatologically. And so you will see that the lot of the children of Israel is that God preserved them. He protected them in his love and his mercy so that all these sins did not come upon them. And I praise the Lord for you if you are a child of God. There is protection for you. Now let us see in this chapter 8, we're going to look at three points. Point number one, we're going to see the plagues of frogs and lice and flies in Egypt. Point number two, purpose of miracles of judgment. Point number three, Pharaoh's temporary humility and insincerity. Pharaoh's temporary humility and insincerity. Let us look at this in uh, point one, plagues of frogs, lice, and flies in Egypt. Exodus chapter 8, we're starting from verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, Go unto Pharaoh, 
and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. And if thou refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite all the borders, all thy borders with frogs. Let's stop there for a moment. Here warning came unto Pharaoh. You see the first plague that came, that is water being turned into blood, had now uh, taken place for seven days. Look at verse 25 of chapter 7. And seven days were fulfilled. After that, the Lord had smitten the river. And Pharaoh had enough chance to think. Because of the interval of seven days between the first plague and the plague that we're going to read about now, the plague of frogs. That interval gave opportunity to Pharaoh to repent before God acted in judgment again. This second plague would not have come if he had repented. This judgment that came, the one we are reading about now, would not have struck, it would not have stricken upon Pharaoh and Egypt if Pharaoh had repented. Can't we say that in our lives? A lot of sufferings we have gone through, a lot of chastisements we have gone through, a lot of discipline we have gone through will not have happened if we have lived our lives in obedience to the Lord. The first time the Lord spoke unto us. Chapter 8, Exodus verse 3. And the river shall bring forth frogs abundantly, which shall go up and come into thine house, and into thy bedchamber, and upon thy bed, and into thy house, into the house of thy servants, and upon thy people, and into thine ovens, and into thy kneading troughs. Uh, and the frogs shall come up both on thee, and upon thy people, and upon all thy servants. And the Lord spake unto Moses, say unto Aaron, Stretch forth thine hand with thy rod over the streams, over the rivers, and over the ponds, and cause frogs to come up upon the land of Egypt. And Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt. And the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. And the magicians did so with their enchantments and brought up frogs upon the land of Egypt. Let's stop there for a moment. This was a plague that came upon them. In fact, we're told by the psalmist. Let's look at this in Psalm 78 verse 45. Psalm 78, we're looking at the latter part of verse 45. And frogs which destroyed them. And frogs which destroyed them. So you can see that's a confirmation by the psalmist that these things actually took place. Frogs came all over the land. And so here we learn that God threatened, God warned, and then he brought it to pass. Well, God is not a man that is your lie. If he gives a positive promise, he will fulfill it. If he gives a negative one, which is judgment, he will also fulfill it. The plague was not a mere inconvenience. It was a real punishment upon them because the psalmist said he brought uh, frogs among them which destroyed them. You see, men of position, men of wealth, and men of authority, social status, they provoke and invite the judgment of God by rejecting the truth of God and by slighting the servants of God. In this case, the magicians were unable to remove the frogs. Neither could they erect any barrier against their encroachment. All they could do was to bring more frogs. It's just like we have said before. They cannot remove our pain. They cannot remove our problems. They cannot remove our suffering. All they can do is to increase and multiply them. It is still true today. All that Satan and his agents can do is to multiply our suffering, our problems, and our pain. Now, what was the reaction of Pharaoh unto this? When the frogs came all over the land, look at it in verse 8. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go, that they may do sacrifice unto the Lord. I'll comment about that promise later, but eventually he called upon Moses and Aaron. He wanted the frogs to be taken away from him. And then in verse 10, and he said, 
tomorrow because Moses had asked him, when do you want these frogs to be taken away? Then he said, tomorrow. And then it says, be it according to thy word, that thou mayest know that it is that the Lord, that there is none like unto the Lord our God. Then in verse 11, and the frogs shall depart from thee, and from thy house, and from thy servants, and from thy people, that they, may remain, that they shall remain in the river only. And Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh. And Moses cried unto the Lord because of the frogs which he had brought against Pharaoh. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses. And the frogs died out of the houses, out of the villages, and out of the fields. And they gathered them together upon hills, and the land stirred. Uh, let's notice something here. Eventually, when Pharaoh said, Please entreat the Lord for me. Please pray for me. So that the frogs will leave the land of Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron prayed. And actually, God did perform a miracle. I want you to realize the kind of miracle here. God could have just issued a word of power, a word of command, a word of authority. And the frogs could have gone back into the rivers like they came. And God could have cleared all that by some supernatural power. But God did not. You see, God has various ways of answering prayer in the way that will suit his own purpose. How did he answer the prayer of Moses and of Aaron? He made all the frogs to die. And as those frogs died, the frogs were stinking. And then these Egyptians had to carry them and put them upon hills and hills and hills. Why did God do that? Why didn't he just remove those things and, get, and tell them to go back to the rivers, which he could do? So that as they were gathering up all these uh, dead frogs, they'll be thinking, if we had obeyed God. They'll be thinking, look at the power of God. Because if the sin had just gone away like that, in just in a few minutes, they wouldn't have had all that time to think. But as we see in every village, in every town, in every city, and all the places, just in, in the front of every house, they were carrying all these frogs in, in heaps of multitudes of them. It was a reminder that they had been rebelling against God, and this is what brought all this unto them. Eventually all the frogs were cleared. But look at verse 15. And when Pharaoh saw that there was respite, he hardened his heart and hearkened not unto them, as the Lord had said. Before we point accusing finger against uh, Pharaoh, let us see this, that many times at a time of sickness, we make vows and consecration. When the sickness is gone, do we obey the Lord? Do we carry out the fulfillment of those vows and consecrations immediately? At a time of any kind of suffering, at the kind of poverty, at a time of poverty, we will make consecrations to God, make our vows unto the Lord. After the Lord has answered our prayers and the suffering has uh, gone down and then we are now relieved, do we follow through and do we obey the Lord at a time of discipline when we've done something wrong and the Lord chastises us and disciplines us? How we walk humbly, how we walk gently, how we look very sober, how we even appear to be prayerful. And we promise the Lord, O oh Lord, if I get out of this, I'll be obedient to you all the time. But when the chastisement and the suffering and the discipline has been lifted, have we not sometimes acted like Pharaoh? Let us be very careful that there will be not in us the kind of hardened heart of Pharaoh. Now, when Pharaoh hardened his heart, and he will not listen to the voice of that plague, and he will not totally yield, and he will not fulfill his promise, as he has said, what followed? Well, like you imagine, another plague followed. Look at it from verse 16 of Exodus chapter 8. And the Lord said unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, Stretch out thy rod, and smite the dust of the land, that it may become lies throughout all the land of Egypt. And they did so, for Aaron stretched out a sand with his rod, and smote the dust of the earth, and became lies in man and in beast. All, all the dust of the land became lies throughout all the land of Egypt. 
and the magicians did so with their enchantments to bring forth lies. But they could not. So there were lies upon man and upon beast. Then the magicians said unto Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he hearkened not unto them, as the Lord had said. You see, this second plague came upon them. We're told that it came without a moment's warning, without advance notice unto Pharaoh. It came as a sudden judgment upon the truth breaking Pharaoh and upon his people because he had broken the promise he gave unto the Lord. A warning for us. A warning for us. If we break our promises with God, if we refuse to do the things we have told the Lord we will do, we said we will worship him. We said we will serve him. We said our whole life will be lived to the glory of God. If we don't, if we consciously, deliberately rebel against what we have even promised the Lord we're going to do. Do you think that judgment can come? Do you know that judgment can come and come suddenly without advance notice? How many things has God spoken to you about? How many times have you prayed and said, Oh Lord, oh Lord, if you will deliver me and rescue me from this situation, Oh Lord, I know what you are talking about. I know what you require from me. I know the demands of your word upon my life. Oh Lord, I will definitely obey you. I want to encourage you. It is wonderful and it is good, full of blessing. When we obey the word of the Lord. Well, as soon as Pharaoh saw that that plague had been taken away, then he hardened his heart. But then at this time now, another plague came. The dust of the ground suddenly became lies, little, little insects that covered their body from the head to different parts of their body. And you know how irritating it is, how troublesome it is when some women have uh, lies, li these little, little insects in the head. And you know how terrible it can be when some men have that type of insect in the head. And you see at this time it was not only in the head, it was all over. And it was in their dogs, it was in their cattle, it was on the beast, it was on man, it was on beast as well. Very, very inconveniencing, not only that, the magicians tried to do it and they could not. The Lord restrained them that they could not. He did not permit them to go, to go on in their folly of trying to duplicate all these miracles of judgment. And the magicians had to confess, this is the finger of God. It proved to the Egyptian and also to, to all men of all ages the supremacy of the God of heaven. Observe the resources of God. He could use the dust and torment men if he wanted to. The least thing in his hand can become an instrument of torment, an instrument of judgment, an instrument of fraud. Also God's finger or the least of his power can make the devil and his agents to fail. How foolish it is for any of us to resist the will of the Almighty God. How thoughtless it is for any of us to reject the word of the Almighty God. I want you to realize another thing. That these are the last recorded words of the magicians in all this series of events we are reading about. The last words are, this is the finger of God. They acknowledge the power and the supremacy of God. So will it be in the great day with Satan and all sinners. You know what will happen? They will have to admit. They will have to bow the knee. They will have to know that God is supreme over all things and over all people. Now, we're told at the end of verse 19 that Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. Because of this, another plague had to come again. We're looking at that from verse 20 to verse 24. And the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning, and stand before Pharaoh. And lo, he cometh forth to the water, and say unto him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. Do you see that God never changes his demand? You see, from the very beginning, God had been saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me. Our God is a consistent God. 
it doesn't change the message just because man is not willing to obey you see i told you before there are some people there are some people that that think that they'll buy time and that if they will delay obedience to the word of god maybe in a few years time god will change his message never changes his demand never changes if he tells man to repent he stands there for ages if he tells man to make restitution to make right his way he never changes his word you see he sent moses unto pharaoh he said it's still the same message it's still the same demand it's still the same thing nothing more nothing less nothing else you see that is what we learn of god when god tells you in the word of god follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the lord it doesn't change nothing more nothing less nothing else it's going to bring the same demand upon your life and so he brought the same demand upon pharaoh's life he said let my people go there's nothing else i want there's nothing else i'm demanding from you and there is no substitute for the message of the word of god in pharaoh's life or in your life let my people go that they may serve me and here comes the warning in verse 21 else if thou will not let my people go behold i will send swarms of flies upon thee and upon thy servants and upon thy people and into thy houses and the houses of the egyptians shall be full of swarms of flies and also the ground whereon they are verses 22 and 23 i read it before look at it again and i will sever in that day the land of goshen in which my people dwell he even knew where the people were living. His own people. He knows where you are living. And we know that all through the scripture. Don't you know when uh, Saul, the king of Israel, was hiding himself. And then they said, who is he that is going to be king of Israel? We're looking for him. God told Samuel, this is where he's hiding. Go there. You will fish him out. You will see him. Don't you remember when God sent through the angel to go and call Peter in Joppa? He told Cornelius, he said, this is the house number. Don't you remember when God was telling uh, Ananias about Saul that behold he prayed. He said this is the particular place where you will find him, where you will locate him. In fact, those that were not in the house, in a house like the eunuch of Ethiopia, the spirit of God directed Philip exactly to the spot on the road. You see, God knows where you are. If you are a child of God, blessings will follow you. If you are a child of God, he knows where you are, he knows where you live, he knows the conditions of all that place. And so God said in verse 22, And I will serve her in that day the land of Goshen, in which my people dwell, that swarms of flies shall, uh, no swarms of flies shall be there, to the end thou mayest know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth, and I will put a division, a separation, between my people and thy people, for to tomorrow this sign shall be in verse 24 and the lord did so and there came a grievous worm of flies seen to the house of pharaoh and into his servants houses and into all the land of egypt and the land and the land was corrupted by reason of the swarm of flies here we see the judgment of god how it came upon the people you see, these appear to be little, little things when you think of lies, when you think of flies, when you think of frogs, and yet these were the things that the Lord used in tormenting the people and bringing judgment and his wrath upon them. He was told that if he did not obey the commandments of the God of Israel, that these swarms of fly will come upon Pharaoh and upon all the Egyptians. Pharaoh disregarded the warning and consequently, the disease-carrying insects came upon the land. In fact, we are told in the Psalms that he sent diverse sorts of flies among them, which devoured them. The flies of this plague were evidently formidable kind, very grievous. In fact, the Bible says that he spake, and there came diverse sorts of flies, all kinds of flies. There were flies that devoured and flies that stung them. There were disease-carrying flies that corrupted them. There were flies upon men and flies upon cattle. But you, you have noticed already the tenderness and the great love in the word of God towards his people when he said, I will serve her in that day. 
the land of Goshen in which my people dwell. And no swarms of flies shall be there. I will put a division between my people and thy people. It's wonderful to be a child of God because God is not unmindful of his own. The Lord never forgets those whose hearts are perfect towards him and whose trust is in the Almighty. It's just like what we're told in Psalm 91, verses 4 through to verse 14. We cannot read everything, everything now because of our time. There shall no evil befall thee. Neither shall any plague come near thy dwelling, because you have set your love upon the Lord. Say it this way, holiness shields the household of faith. Holiness protects the household of faith. Now, we have seen these plagues that came upon the land of Egypt, that came upon Pharaoh and came upon his servants and came upon everyone, every one of the Egyptians apart from the people of God. What was the purpose of God in these miracles of judgment? Because we know that God never does anything without a purpose. God had a purpose. What was the purpose of God? That leads us to point two. And we're now back in Exodus chapter 8. I'm reading to you from verse 10. Exodus chapter 8 verse 10. And he said, Tomorrow, that is, Moses had asked from Pharaoh, When should the plagues be taken away from you? Look at it from verse 9. And Moses said unto Pharaoh, Glory over me. When shall I entreat for thee and for thy servants? and for thy people to destroy the frogs from thee and thy houses, and that they may remain in the river only. And he said, tomorrow, before I go on to the purpose, I want you to understand the power that Moses had with God, the power that he had with heaven. And Moses knew it. Moses had confidence in God. I told you at the beginning of chapter 7 that a change had come upon Moses. Here Moses believed that if he prayed, God will answer. Do you believe like that? Do you know that if you pray, God will answer? And Moses confidently, confidently, and I want you to imagine this, that frogs filled not only one house, not only one avenue, not only one street, not only one community, one local government. It filled all the land of Egypt. And yet and Moses believed that if he prayed, those frogs will be gotten rid of. What great faith he had. You see a change had come upon him. He was no more weak in faith. He was no more uncertain about his calling and about his mission. As the time come in your life, when you are no more uncertain, when you are confident, when you trust God, when you know that God does answer prayer and God can answer your prayer. And so Moses said unto Pharaoh, glory over me, choose the day and choose the time when the frogs will all be gotten rid of. I'm going to pray about that. Exactly that will happen. And then Pharaoh said, he said tomorrow, that's in verse 10. Now, let me still follow on on this thought of the answer to the prayer of Moses. Verse 12. And Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh. And Moses cried unto the Lord because of the frogs, which he had brought against Pharaoh. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses. Stop there for a moment. You see, Moses had done according to the word of the Lord. Now the Lord did according to the word of Moses. That's the way it works. That's the way it works. Moses did according to the word of the Lord. We read that over and over and over. Now it comes to the Lord's turn. The Lord did according to the word of Moses. That's the way it is in our lives. The more you obey God, the more God honors your prayer. Because God says, he that honors me, him I will honor. But the one that lightly esteems me, also will be lightly esteemed. If you will do according to the word of the Lord, it's, it's going to be a guarantee for you. That the Lord also is going to do according to your word. And then in verse 13, And the frogs died out of the houses, out of the villages, and out of the fields. Let's still see about this, God answering the prayer of Moses, because this is very important, this is very essential. From verse 29, And Moses said, Behold, I go out from thee, and I will entreat the Lord that the swarms of flies may depart. 
from Pharaoh and from his servants and from his people tomorrow. Tomorrow is there again. But let not Pharaoh deal deceitfully anymore in not letting the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. And Moses went out from Pharaoh and entreated the Lord. Verse 31, and the Lord did according to the word of Moses. To me, that is very interesting. To me, it is very interesting that God, the mighty God of heaven, will say, Moses, because you said so, I will do it. I will honor you. You did according to my word. I will do according to your word. You see, God upheld the word of Moses in prayer. And that's the challenge I'm giving to you. Make yourself special to God. Make yourself to be in a special place with God. Let God know something about you. That you never twist the word of God. He will never twist your word. You, you never change the word of God. He will never change your word. You never confront. You never change the authority of God. He will never change your authority. Even before the greatest enemy. Even before the land of idolatry. Even in your village where it appears that people are sold unto idol worship. Because you do according to the word of the Lord. I tell you the Lord will do according to your own word. According to your own word. And so Moses went out and he prayed. He entreated the Lord. And see, he was praying for Pharaoh. You know, this gives me a great encouragement. That Moses was praying for Pharaoh that had set himself to be a rebellious person against God. You see, when I pray for you, I'm not praying for people that have set themselves against God. If Moses could pray to God, could talk to God concerning Pharaoh that was rebellious, that was disobedient, that even his humility was a false humility. It was a pretended, it was a temporary humility. It was full of insincerity. And when Moses prayed for such an individual, God honored the word of Moses. You think about it, you are a child of God if you have repented. You are coming to the Bible study every time. You want to do the will of God. When your leaders pray for you, God will answer. When Moses prayed for Pharaoh, even Pharaoh, even Pharaoh, think about it, the tyrant, that injurious fellow, the one that uh, many times had in the sad. When Moses said, oh God, do this for this land of Egypt, God did it. That's our confidence that if we pray for you, then God will have to answer. But in your own case yourself, you can pray. You can pray. If you will do according to the word of the Lord, the Lord will do according to your own word. Look at it in verse 31. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses. And he removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people. And there remained not one. There remained not one. Is it possible for us to pray that God will so remove all your sicknesses and all your pains and all your troubles until there remained not one? Oh yes, I believe it is possible. Moses prayed and there remained not one fly in the land of Egypt. God is able to do it and he does it today. Now, we're going to see this point too. The purpose of the miracles of judgment. I've read to you in verse 10. Let's look at verse 10 again. And he said tomorrow, and he said, Be it according to thy word, that thou mayest know, this is the purpose of the miracle, that thou mayest know that there is none like unto the Lord our God. The purpose why God sent these miracles of judgment upon the people of Egypt is so that the people will realize that God is supreme, that God is great, that it was the public manifestation of the mighty power of God. They were also a divine visitation of us, a series of chastisements and punishment upon Pharaoh and the Egyptians for cruelly oppressing the people of Israel. Through these plagues, the Lord executed judgment upon the idols, upon the gods of Egypt. Let us look at Numbers chapter 33 verse 4. Numbers chapter 33. And we're looking at it from verse 4. Here we have the word of the Lord telling us the purpose of those miracles of judgment. For the Egyptians buried all their firstborn, which the Lord had smitten among them. Upon their gods also 
the Lord executed judgment. Upon their gods also, the Lord executed judgment. So you will see that the reason why God brought all these things upon them is that he had to execute judgment upon their idols, upon their gods. He had to show them that their idols were nothing. But that God is much, much greater, infinitely greater than all their idols, all their gods. In fact, if you see from the testimony of Jethro in Exodus chapter 18, Exodus chapter 18, Moses had related to Jethro all the accounts of what God did for them in the land of Egypt. If you read it from verse 8, eventually, here is the testimony and the word of Jethro in verse 11. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods, for in the sin wherein they dealt proudly, he was above them. In the sin wherein they dealt proudly, he was above them. Not only that, we see another reason why God brought all these judgments upon the land of Egypt. We're told in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 26, and we're looking at it from verse 9. Open your Bible. Isaiah chapter 26, we're looking at it from verse 9. With my soul have I desired thee in the night. Yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early. This is very important. For when thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. When thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Oh, you say, did that happen to uh, the Egyptians? Well, let's look at this, uh, at these two verses in Exodus chapter 10. Exodus chapter 10, from verse 16 and verse 17. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron in haste. And he said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Can you believe that? Here is the fulfillment of what I've just read to you in Isaiah 26 verse 9, the latter part. When thy judgments are in there, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Here Pharaoh confessed, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now therefore, verse 17 of Exodus chapter 10, Now therefore forgive, I pray thee, my sin only this one, and entreat the Lord your God that he may take away from me this death only. And so you will see that God had a purpose in bringing all those plagues upon the land of Egypt. We need to think about this other thing. You see, the children of Israel have been themselves about 400 years in the land of Egypt, the land of idolatry, where the true God was entirely unknown. God therefore manifested himself so that Israel could recognize the existence, the power, the omnipotence, the supremacy of the true God in contradistinction to the impotency of the false gods of Egypt and of the world. That means then, these plagues were also designed to establish the faith of the children of Israel in the true God. These miracles reveal clearly that all the elements of nature, all the animals indeed, all created things in the universe are under the control of our God. Let's now go to the last point, point three, which is, most, uh, which is Pharaoh's temporary humility and insincerity. We're looking at Pharaoh's temporary humility and insincerity. We're back in Exodus chapter 8. Exodus chapter 8. You see when the uh, second plague, that's the plague of the frogs, when it came. And when Pharaoh saw the effect of all those frogs upon the land, look at his reaction, his response in verse 8. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron. And said, Entreat the Lord, that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people. And I will let the people go, that they may do sacrifice unto the Lord. If you look at that, you will think, Oh, the man has yielded at last. You will think, The man has given in at last. Now he wants them to go and serve the Lord. Well, it was temporary. It was short-lived. Look at verse 15. But when Pharaoh saw that there was respite, he hardened his heart 
and hearkened not unto them, as the Lord had said. There's another time he tried again to show that he was not ready to let the people go. Look at it in verse 25. And Pharaoh called for Moses and for Aaron, and said, Go ye, sacrifice to your God in the land. If you look at that, you say, Praise the Lord. He has now allowed them to go and sacrifice to their Lord. But look at the last three words of verse 25. In the land. In the land. That was contrary to the will of God. That was contrary to the demand of God. It was contrary to what Moses had been demanding. You see, if you, if you don't look at what these people of the world are giving, you will not know the subtlety. You will not know the cleverness. You will not know the compromise they want to get you into. You know what God's commandment was? Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness, not in the land. God wanted them far away from Egypt. Moses was not deceived by Pharaoh's proposal. His answer was prompt and uncompromising. He said in verses 26 and 27, look at them. And Moses said, it is not right, it is not meet to do so. For we shall sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians to the Lord our God. Lo, shall we sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians before their eyes, and will they not stone us? We will go through this journey into the wilderness that's exactly what the lord had said into the wilderness to do sacrifice to sacrifice to the lord our god as he shall command us as he shall command us now this is the same thing we need to notice as well it's like moses was telling pharaoh the lord has told us be ye separate and so we're going to be separate and the lord has told us children of god in second corinthians chapter 6 Verse 17, be ye separate and taught not the unclean thing. Then he says, then I will receive you. And ye shall be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. You see, we should be very, very careful to do what God wants us to do in the way he wants us to do it. Pharaoh said, you can sacrifice in the land. Moses said, that's not possible. God commanded, do it in the wilderness, a way separate from Egypt. When God has spoken to us in his word, that should settle the matter and there is no room for reasoning, debate or compromise. The word of God and nothing else must regulate our worship, regulate our service, regulate everything else. It is not enough to worship God. We must worship him in the manner he has made known in his word. Human opinions, human traditions, human custom or personal convenience have nothing to do with the word of God. Our duty is to submit to God's word, whatever the cost may be. And so, next, Pharaoh resorted to another subtle compromise. Look at verse 28. And Pharaoh said, I will let you go, that ye may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness. You see, he said, in the land before, Moses said, no, it cannot be like that. It has to be in the wilderness. So he said, that's all right. I will allow you to go. I will let you go. That ye may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness. Then he limited them in this way. Only ye shall not go very far away. Only ye shall not go very far away in trade for me. Now can you see again what Pharaoh, Pharaoh was saying? He said, well, you want to worship God? Don't go far. You want to go to church? Don't go far. You want to obey the word of the Lord? Don't go too far. Do you want to go and do sacrifice to the, your God in the wilderness? All right, I'm going to let you do that, but ye shall not go very far away. I want to remind you that the very purpose for which the Lord sent Moses to Pharaoh was to lead his people out of Egypt, to bring them into the land of Canaan, far away from Egypt. Beware of Satan's subtle advice, not very far away, because that's what he will always tell you. Worship God, don't go too far. Read the Bible, don't go too far. Give unto the Lord, but don't go too far. And make sure that you consecrate your life to the Lord, but don't go too far. And you must help other people, but don't go too far. 
carry out the injunctions and the commandments of the Lord in the word of God. But don't go too far. That's what the devil will always say. Not very far away. But please remember, the purpose of the true Christian ministry is to bring every member in the church very far away from the world. Not very far away, alas. How many who name the name of Christ have never gone far away from their former manner. God demands that we be separate from this present evil world because our citizenship is in heaven. Philippians chapter 3 verse 20. In fact, the Bible says, the whole world lies in wickedness. The margin says it lies in the wicked one. To abide in the world or to abide near the borders of the world is to take up quarters on Satan's ground. As soon as the plague of, plague of flies was removed, what was the attitude of Pharaoh? Let's look at it from verse 29. And Moses said, Behold, I go out from thee, and I will entreat the Lord, that the swarms of flies may depart from Pharaoh, and from his servants, and from his people, tomorrow. But let not Pharaoh deal deceitfully anymore, in not letting the people go to sacrifice to the Lord, and Moses went out from Pharaoh and entreated the Lord. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses. And he removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people. And there remained not one, but started to you. And Pharaoh had in his heart at this time also. Neither will he let the people go. You see, that's the attitude of many people. I told you that before, that when a better time comes, when the relief comes, when the healing comes, when prosperity comes, when answer to prayer comes, then they harden their hearts. Let us realize, now Pharaoh had been hardening his heart before. Some people would say, maybe God was hardening his heart. Look at this verse attitude. And Pharaoh hardened his heart. At this time also, which means he's been doing it before, he's done it again. Neither will he let the people go. As soon as the plague was removed, Pharaoh then went back again. He will not fulfill his vow, his promise that he had made. What did that bring? Well, when you come next week, you will see the supremacy of God, the power of God, the greatness of God. You will see that we, we cannot play with God as if we're just uh, teasing little boys. This God is mighty. In fact, his unfaithfulness, that is, the unfaithfulness of Pharaoh, his obstinacy and hardness of heart, only brought heavier judgments upon him and upon his land. As I told you, what we have next week is something you cannot miss. I'm going to show you and the order of the place and it is in the in the message that follows after the one of next week we're going to summarize everything and we're going to look at the comparison of all these plagues with the great tribulation that will come upon the christ rejecting world when christ would have taken all the church away at the time of the rapture these are studies that a Christian should not be ignorant of. All these things that we're looking at is what you should go and tell all the other believers around you, all members of this church and even other people that are not members of this church. This is a time when God is visiting us and is revealing the depth of his truth and the depth of his knowledge and the depth and the height of his power unto us. And you need to come along and bring other people along that we may come and rejoice in discovering the power, the greatness, the majesty, the supremacy of our God over all gods. When you study all these things, there remains nothing of fear in your heart. You know that the God you serve, the God you depend upon, is so mighty, there's nothing, there's no one that can confront his power. For today, let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. With all these things that we have learned, You've seen how the plagues came upon Pharaoh. You've seen that no tyrant could, could withstand God or resist God or reject God, the word of God, successfully. You have seen the purpose of the plagues. You've seen how God answered the prayer of Moses. Bring all these things that were learned unto the Lord. Spend real time, quality time with the Lord in prayer before you go.